And David and I are shambolic at this. So yesterday, oh, you're quite good. yesterday's it took an hour and a half to record eight minute episode. Really? Yeah. I did every mini NBA thirty five minute take in one, with did one you? exception. Did you? Okay. Oh. Ready? Hello and welcome to Media Snack Meets. You might recognise this uh, fine young gentleman, Mark Ritson, uh, visiting us from Australia. Uh, could you do me a favour and just introduce yourself, Mark? Sure. Um, well, I do many things, you know, e each of them equally badly. I'm a, uh, my main job, I suppose, is I'm a marketing professor, adjunct these days, which is basically part-time at Melbourne Uni down in Australia. Uh, I work as a, a branding consultant for a range of different companies, you know, at different times, and um, I write a column for Marketing Week. Uh, I suppose they're the three main jobs. Brilliant. And what brings you all this way to London this week? Oh, many different things. So we've had Festival of Marketing this week, which mm -hmm. is tied to Marketing Week. So I was booked in to do that as part of my contractual obligations this year. Mm -hmm. And then on the back of that, I did a big TV uh, uh, festival event for the Belgians in Brussels mm -hmm. on Monday. And then I did uh, JC Deco's uh, Upfront in London on Wednesday. And then, yeah, loads of Festival of Marketing stuff and a big debate with Professor Byron Sharp last night on the future and soul of marketing, which was terrific, mm. but resulted in a rather hot, I got pissed afterwards because it was, it was a bit stressful and it went well, I think, for both of us. And then I, I, I relaxed in the only way <laughs> I do now, which is by getting hammered. Excellent. Actually, I was going to ask you about that, about mm. that, uh, that face-off because it was, it was highly trumpeted and well attended and well received. Yeah. My question in going into this is, you've come all the way over from Australia mm. to participate in that, as has Mr. Byron Sharp. Mm. Are there, and we have, some viewers will be aware of people like Scott Galloway in New York and other kind of like famous marketing professors. Yeah, Galloway's great, yeah. Where are the good female marketing professors and oh. where are the British marketing professors? Well, let's do, uh, well, the, the British marketing professors are unfortunately up their own asses. Um, the state of British marketing professors is abysmal. Uh, most of them have never done a day's marketing work in their lives, I'm not exaggerating. And while we may differ in our opinions about programmatic, the difference between me and most of them is I know what programmatic is. So yeah, they're so hopeless. Marketing became a route to pure academia, which I was part of until I started doing proper work on, on the side. So uh, in terms of female marketing professors, this is a more troubling, I mean, we'll never get any, obviously I'm British originally, but British marketing departments are not gonna produce, you know, in my opinion, anyone of, of interest. Scott Galloway, as you mentioned, and Professor Sharp, they're probably the big two. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, women is tr more troubling, because there's no reason we could, Jennifer Arker, who's pretty good, and she's at UCLA, but she's not, yeah, yeah, we could do with, you mm -hmm. know, we could do with a couple of, you know, members yeah. of the opposite sex to balance things out. It gets a bit meaty as it did yesterday with me and Byron, you know. Well, we could give that as a challenge to Russell. Maybe that's his challenge for next, next year's Festival of Marketing. Yeah, that's find someone to join the stage. It would be really good. And it's funny, I got caught up in all this last year because I went through this thing where, you know, when Cindy Gallup was making all these points that I definitely was guilty of you know, just showing lots of quotes from old, white, usually dead men about marketing. And I got called up by one of my students and she's right, you know, yeah. it's bullshit. We've got, to, we've got to work harder. Yeah, good. So what, one of your main obsessions is, is teaching marketing. And this year, and I think last year, you've started this MBA, mini MBA marketing program. Which I believe you completed. Which I completed. So did you do the exam? I case? did, I loved the exam. How did you do? Do you, you should know. Well, I have like 500 students. No, I, uh, I got a B. That's all right. Yeah. Patronizing smile. <laughs> Which I was gutted about. <laughs> I should say. People got obsessed with that exam though. I People went mad about it. absolutely obsessed with it. And it, the, studying this, you, you got to, if you're interested vaguely in marketing or you work in marketing uh, and you fancy a bit of kind of grounding in some like fundamental principles, I highly recommend Mark's uh, mini MBA, uh, which is brilliant. Uh, definitely worth the money. And actually, if your company won't pay for you, pay for it yourself. It's really worth it. I thought you were going to say, if your company won't pay for you, I'll pay for you. I'm like, go no, for it. I'm go not for it. That. Uh, but I, I highly recommend it. I obsessed about the paper. You, I, re I really enjoyed the, the study mm. uh, because it's just, it's easy, you know, it's easy to kind of follow and great to understand and brilliant learning. Uh, and then you gave us this, I think, a, an actual MBA paper from MIT. 
Uh, we had three weeks to complete it, and of mm. course I, I didn't pick it up for two weeks, and then the weekend before it was due to submit I remember your it. emails, yeah, you sent me a couple of messages about it. And I did not sleep <laughs> for 36 hours. It but, becomes so obsessed But of about 250 people were similar. I mean, yeah. you don't have to do the exam, but m about 60% do. And with the previous class, we'd done a really simple Harvard case study, and everyone had gone, you know, it was easy. And a few people would say it was too easy. And I said, well, the only thing I can do is set something that I've set my MBA students at when I taught at MIT, which is really hard. And so we did it. And everyone hated it, but loved the process. I think it's fantastic. So yeah, that, I think we'll repeat that. Yeah. Photocopiers, I think, will be the future for us. It's a fo you run a photocopier company, yeah. don't you? It's so brilliant. And it's, it's real left brain and right brain it stress no, at stuff. the same time. It's real and It's brilliant. Highly recommend it. But one of the biggest... Uh, insights, if you like, or the thing that struck me most significantly in, in doing this whole course related to media was when you describe uh, how much media is a tactic. Yeah. You know, and this whole idea of chain of strategy versus tactic, strategy yeah, versus tactic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you just share that? Because I think it's what was really helpful for me was that it puts, it puts the entire kind of me global media industry, which we say is a half a trillion dollar business mm. full of you know, strategy and research. Sort of strategy and, and kind of ideas and sometimes feels very self-important. And yes. you put it very much in its place. Yeah, so if you completely forget about media for a second and just look at marketing, there are kind of three phases in marketing. There's a diagnosis phase where you do research and segmentation and just understand the market. Then there's a strategy phase, which is often not there, where we come up with our strategic plan, which is all about targeting and positioning and objectives. Mm -hmm. And then there's the tactical delivery of the strategy, which is then, you know, obviously the, you could call it the, the you know, quintessential four Ps or whatever, but the product development, distribution channels, the pricing, the communications. And then within the communications, there's the integrated mix, there's obviously the creative design, there's some sales promotion. And then right at the end of that, one little strand from another strand from another strand is the media, mm. which, you know, if you, if you think about the marketing process as a clock, a 12 hour clock, it's you know 12 minutes to midnight before media comes in. So I think what media professionals sometimes forget, and it is a very important industry, is you are you know the tip of the tip of the tip of the spear, which doesn't mean you're not important, but in the scheme of things to most clients and CMOs, it means, you, yeah, you're really not very important, and no one really cares. Very good. <laughs> That's great. On that joyful note, but it's a lot of money, isn't it? So it's a, it is. It's a slight kind of paradox, because I, I mean, completely agree, you know, you know, I remember years ago working in media agencies and it it's very easy to think because you're dealing with a marketer's biggest budget yeah. and you're, <laughs> you're dealing with a, you know, a, a, a really interesting kind of supply chain, all the TV stations and print and radio and it's all quite kind of glamorous. You, you, have, you do have this kind of sense that you're somewhat in the center of the universe a little bit mm -hmm. in a media agency, which is weird. Now, having been 10 years out of a media agency, I can see that's completely not true. No, no, we never, I mean, if you talk with clients, for example, the, me the only, and we'll get to it later, the only area where media does come up is when obviously there's been some issue of fraud or, or, or some concern about, you know, we're buying things that don't exist. Then it's top of mind. But otherwise, in, in the pre-transparency world, it was just kind of, yeah, and then the money's when we buy the media. Yeah. You know, I mean, we look at the creative, but of course, we look at the creative on TVs inside headquarters. We don't yeah. really think about it. Yeah. So maybe now it's becoming... You know, more, maybe more important, more visible to a CMO, and, and perhaps these the days of just delegating media responsibility off to an external party. Yeah. Maybe that's over because we've got yeah. CMOs. Maybe their boards are now holding them to greater account. They definitely are. And we've got evidence of that. But again, I don't think it's that they they really care. It's just that it has to stop. It's not that they have a positive love of media any more than they did before. It's that now there is genuine risk that they have to remove from the equation. Mm. So if you look at what Mark Pritchard wants, he doesn't want to have his brand managers spend their time on media. He wants them to have to stop having to worry about it so they can do more important stuff, yeah. which for him is creativity and strategy and so on. Yeah, good, okay. Uh, so that brings us nicely on to uh, a quite barnstorming piece, which is your marketing week column this week. Yes. Uh, now, the last couple of years, you seem to have taken more of an interest in media. So a lot of your columns and a lot of your writing and talking has been looking at media issues. And, and yeah, and, and exactly, and following, because clients are start, I mean, I only care about clients, really. I'm not an agency side person. As it's become more important to clients, so so too I have become interested. Yeah. So your 
Colin this week uh, has gathered a, a lot of attention, yeah, as, they, as they often do. Uh, explain for those few people that maybe haven't read it yet, and we'll link to it because you really should read that and all the kind of commentary around yours it. Yours as well, yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, I posted a response this week to it. So what? So what happened was, how yeah, how did that come about? I, I thought this this year, um, as you know, they have advertising week in a number of different places, but the main one is in New York, and they really do lay on like four big days. Mm. Uh, and really positively, I thought they put all, literally all the sessions were online, and so there's some pretty good people, you know, there from mm. Sorrel Dam. So I spent, I don't know which day it was last week, I mean, finished on the Thursday, so probably sometime over the weekend, I watched four or five of them, and they were, you know, some of them were crap, but most of them were very good. And then I got to the one with Lara O'Reilly, who I know very well because she used to write for Marketing Week, mm -hmm. and is now uh, one of the main, she writes the CMO page for uh, Wall Street De uh, Journal. She's very good. She's very, very good, actually. She's, a, she's one to watch. And she was hosting a session with a guy from an ad exchange, um, someone from that retargeting firm, uh, but also with Martin Cass, who, I, apologies, I don't know the two American guys at all, they seem very good. But Martin Cass is interesting because he's British, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, was, he was a media planner of old, uh, went to CARA here, and then was moved across to the US as president of CARA in the US. And Martin Cass just came in and just started, as the French say, to take a massive shit on everything. Um, and, and it was great, but what stunned me more was there was no real, like I watched it sort of slack jawed and went, you know, <laughs> go for it, you know, and it got better and better. But there, was, there wasn't much response to it by the time we got to Sunday. I thought it was gonna crack open. Yeah. And I even emailed Lara and I said, well, yes, that's some session you've got there. And she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, that bit, that bit, that bit. And yeah. even she was a little bit like, oh, okay, well. Mm. So that really why I wrote it yeah. was, AI was really impressed with it. It was obviously newsworthy, but they didn't see, it was just gonna evaporate. Yeah. Which, by the way, is what happened with the John Mandel thing. So John Mandel, another ex-president or CEO of another big American media firm, two years ago at an A&A gig in Miami, did exactly the same thing, just went rogue and started to reveal stuff. And that didn't really get picked up until I think an Aussie guy interviewed him about it afterwards, and then it kicked off. Yeah. So there's a weird thing where no one really picks these things up unless you give it a good push, which, yeah. which is what I was trying to do in Marketing Week this week. That's good. And, uh, I thought Martin, the, you know, Martin's words are really interesting. You should definitely watch the video again. We'll kind of link to that yeah. because it it was uh, it was interesting because for us, I think as well, because it was the first time a sitting CEO, because Mandel, who was previously CEO of MediaCom, he was kind of ten years out of the industry was, business. Yeah. Really interesting and insightful. And if anything, he became the catalyst for lots of this other now subsequent discussion. So, would Martin Cast stand on stage if it were not for? Uh, you know, previous, those had gone before, probably not. Uh, but Martin is currently a CEO of a major US media network. And an independent though, we should an say. An independent, right? who may have an angle, of course, on transparency, has an angle, you know, yeah. and so uh, not, he has maybe the permission or the requirement to talk like this, but, but he is fresh out of running a major network in the US. And so, uh, you know, his insights, uh, are beyond the kind of, I think what Sorrel calls the gossip and the innuendo. Yeah. These are slightly more substantive and that was perhaps what's interesting. I agree, we felt it wasn't gonna catch fire, so thank you. So you saw it uh, before my column, right? And so We'd seen it on Friday, I think when it was, wasn't it? On the Saturday yeah, it came out Friday. And what was your initial reaction to it then? Because I felt like I was the only person that was like quite interested and stunned a bit by it. Yeah, Did you I have mean, the same yeah, reaction? Right, exactly right, exactly right. Because you don't get people talking like this no, on big don't. stages in front of their peers. You know, we, there are lots of these types of conversations, not particularly with Martin necessarily, but with many others, where that will be discussed, but not on stage or not on film. No. Um, There's a great moment, and uh, you'll see it in the film, where about halfway through, Lara says, you know, you keep talking about shining a light and finding the bad guys. You know, well, why don't we name some of the, why doesn't no one ever, anyone yeah. name the bad guys? And one of the American guys is about to sort of give the usual sort of stock answers why we don't do it. And Martin just goes, well, how about the big five holding companies? And it just goes. <laughs> yeah. And then I think he'd, he'd obviously thought a little bit about that in advance and then it just all came out. So anyway, it's good. I mean, it's a good, again, a good catalyst for good debate. Um, you know, you, you prepared a, a, a good perspective dissecting some of the things that he'd said. Yeah, and to be fair, I took his quotes verbatim, but then I, I did go off in my own little direction that Mark Martin may or may not agree with, which was I read this as being X, and therefore I think it, Y will happen. So yeah. that's very much me 
you know, making stuff up as usual, but hopefully making it up correctly. That was good. And then we did a little bit of kind of Yeah, analysis and then you went from Y to Z, which was great. And you know more about it than I do. So I was very interested in the article you wrote, which was how do I feel about Ritz and stuff, uh, which was about how he felt about Cass's stuff. So we kind of, we kind of like a full circle, which I think is really good. So all this talk of crisis, existential crisis, holding company, et cetera, et cetera, you speak to a lot of marketers mm. all the time. So mm. how much does an average or typical CMO care about this stuff? How much attention do they pay to it? Well, they didn't used to pay any attention to it because it was just handled. They're increasingly concerned because it's appearing on the radar of their superiors. Mm. And I think that's what's drawn their attention. You've got two factors here. You've got fraud, however we want to describe our transparency, and you've got the digital do I even get anything from my, my money? Mm. I, I did a bit of research for a big client in Australia last year where we looked at what drives about 400 major advertisers to invest in certain media over other media. And the number one driver, and we didn't ask them, we actually ran it off a correlation score, so it's quite well done. Mm. The number one driver of why you pick, let's say, TV over Facebook or radio over print is um, get what I pay for. Now that's not ROI and that's not you know, impact, that's just, if I bought that, did I actually get that's it? That's a pretty low standard. It's a real low standard. And my point is that's where we are right now. That's why yeah. they're worried because it's too much detail. So what yeah. they're worried about is, am I being ripped off? Yeah. So that's a massive concern for marketers. Okay, so let's, yeah. uh, as then part of this column, mm -hmm. at the end, you provided eight, what were they, kind of like eight things. things. <laughs> Eight things. It's, it's an editorial term, yeah, it's things, right, that's what I we call them. In, in the game, right. that's what we call them. Excellent. I didn't really know what they were either. It was like, I wanted to summarise it in a way that wasn't boring. And I had about three and then it was four and suddenly it was eight. So yeah. it's the eight things that I think Cass's comments and my take on them directly lead me to conclude. Yeah. So that, again, they were very good. We'll post them down below or we'll link to them so you can kind of look. So let, if, should we just go through those yes. things? Because yes. I think each of those is really important. We, we've been talking here, uh, you know, David and I and the team, about those eight things, because that was a really interesting provocation. I think we broadly agree that those are the eight things, to use the technical term, yes. that we probably should be thinking about. Um, but let's go through. Our general observation, though, was that all of the things that you listed as maybe being major considerations for 2018, mm. are actually, we think, are considerations right now, to greater or lesser extent. I yeah, think the fair. differentiation or the, dis, you know, the distinction between one and another, uh, maybe that's more in, or mostly interesting, is when it's going to be. When a, the shoe will fall. Really, yeah, when it's going to kind of. Which is interesting because I, I really, ex and we should put this as, a, as an interesting sort of side issue. When I wrote it, I really thought, push back ahoy. For, you know, when I, I, email, I, I did email you, didn't I? I said, yeah. no, I'd be interested to see what you think. And, not just to get some you know, extra you know, publicity, but more that I really did think you'll give me six out of eight. But you and pretty much everyone else, with the exception of one person who works for a media agency, um, has just gone, yes, which yeah. is very rare with my columns. I mean, I aim for a 50-50 split, or I, I do feel I've been unsuccessful. So yeah. this is one of the most, in my opinion, scandalous uh, stories, and, and certainly questionable ones, and yet it's probably been the most unanimously received in the last 12 months. Yeah. Which so is, a, is that a failure in your eyes? Then? That it, it, it is kind of, yeah. I could have gone a lot harder. I don't know how, because I, I do genuinely want 50%. I mean, columnists are not meant to be, you know, when I started writing marketing magazines and stuff 20 years ago, columnists would write things like, should we listen to customers? I think we should. You know what I mean? It was like, come yeah. on, you know. Unless you've got half the people going, you are in. I mean, I love it when the feedback is, you're a nutter, you don't understand marketing. And the next guy is, you're a genius, you know more about marketing than anyone else. That's the win, you yeah. know what I mean? That's yeah. what economists meant to do. It's not meant to be like, yeah, should we be more profitable next year? I yeah. think so, I think well, so. I think, we, but we know, because these things are contentious issues, is that we tend to find 50% of the people say, yes, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah. then 50% of the people, they don't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, but they're, maybe that's... They're not part of the discussion because they don't want to be part of the discussion. Yeah, and I think what, we, what we're getting here with this particular topic is, to, to the way you're talking about it here, it's not whether or not it's happening or true, it's whether we're prepared to talk about it or not and what the implications are. Yeah. It's not, you know, 
this is scandalous, but, but it's, everyone knows it's going on. So this stuff is out in the public domain. Martin Cass has obviously been adding to that in the last week or so. Um, we probably don't need to drill down necessarily each of those kind of things. It's been like well discussed. We should um, stay away from them. Just for legal reasons, Mark. We will, we will name no, he's worried I might okay. name some company names, which I certainly won't. That we haven't just been talking is about it, off if, camera. If I get caught, yes, yeah, we won't be repeating that conversation. Um, yeah, if I get caught in Marketing Week saying something like this, Marketing Week get, get sued, which is great. But I think on this one, it, it's me. So I'm with you on this one, Tom. So yeah, absolutely. So let's, we'll, we'll stick within the, the, the guardrails of the piece that you've written. Let's just talk about that. Yeah, and I think there's lots to that. talk about anyway, because as you said, like, I, you know, you nailed eight you know, ideas to the mast, whatever. Uh, let's go through those. Okay. So the first one that you talked about, which I thought was interesting, so is that confusion, we call it, let's call it confusion. Confusion will continue. Yes. So what did you mean? Uh, no one has any idea what's going on. Um, literally anyone. So uh, anyone that tells you they understand ad exchanges, programmatic, uh, commission structures, value banks, um, whatever the new latest GDP, RSQ, whatever it is, they're lying to you. Nobody knows what's going on. And if you look at the real interesting story for me about brand safety, which is by and large a made up thing for the most part, it's that brand safety caused a number of very large companies to pull their digital media spend. Mm. And what they discovered when they pulled it was, hang on a minute, that, Nothing th happened. That, that doesn't make sense. Now, my point there is, first of all, look at all of that nonsense that was going on. But now, they would not have discovered that if they had not, for another reason, been forced to pull it. And we're talking here about JP Morgan Chase, you know, P&G, Uber. These are not dumb companies. Mm. I have a strong belief that most, po and I'm happy to go on the record here, that most programmatic is, is a total nonsense. If you had to make me completely arbitrarily guess, I think 70, 80% of the media that's being bought is totally pointless. Pretty certain. I don't disagree with that, the, the, the number, but I do disagree with the fact that it's programmatic. Ah, so yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And, and, and I think you or somebody else has been making a point recently as well, is that programmatic is, is an irretrievable kind of concept now. Like The word is so toxic it's fucked, yeah. that marketers will never use it. Well, but that's a good quote of everyone else, right? Wait and see. I mean, I'm pretty sure we're right. I'm certain we're right you will find that programmatic will disappear somewhere in the middle of 2018 because, and I, I really think it's important, and I mentioned this in the column, programmatic, if you go back six, seven years, was the bright, gleaming robot bullet that was gonna make everything great and transparent and real time. Look how quickly we've turned it into shit. You know, it's only taken us five years to completely destroy that concept and make it an unnameable thing. I mean, that's what marketing can do, right? Yeah. At its best. I mean, yeah. you know. I'm laughing because that's honestly. <laughs> Yeah, my father, talking about programmatic. My first and only time I've ever had my dad on the job and he's sleeping. We're doing really well. Yeah. Good. Uh, so, composure. No, it's fine. Don't worry. I'm, I'm falling asleep. <laughs> we're saying it's, well, we're saying it's happening now. David and I kind of disagree somewhat on this. Oh, oh, no, right. I was picking you up on programmatic, wasn't I? Because programmatic is not the reason that all this is happening. We have to remind everybody that mm. programmatic is a technique of buying media. Mm -hmm. It's an automated way of buying media. So by definition, it can't be to blame. It can't be <laughs> it to blame. Know what, it doesn't know what it's doing. Now, one of the, <laughs> one of the symptoms of adopting programmatic uh, is that you can, or one of, the, one of the outcomes, is that you can create a system that buys terribly poor quality inventory or non-existent human clicks okay and it can optimize against all of that stuff without being able to differentiate one from the other yeah, yeah, yeah. programmatic principles we should be able to apply to anything else in yeah. the way any other mean we're going to come on to talk about that so you know I, I think it'd be sad if the word programmatic disappeared but I mean you're of the opinion that it's, oh, so it's already happened it's no gone. no it's already happened I think Cass says the same thing that, that we'll see it move to automated buying ad exchange there's something else yeah. will come there's no way you can get away with it now. Yeah. It's, it's finished. So that's a whole industry. We've just kind of let that's gone. Well, I think the industry survives, but it will just rebrand itself as something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? As I'm trying to give an example where an industry's done that. But yeah, we don't want to refer to interior decoration. I'm an interior decorator. I'm not yeah. someone that buys vases and stuff. No, no, no. I'm an interior decorator. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. Not a painter. 
I'm not a painter. No, 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 no. I don't choose wallpaper. Yeah. No, no, no. Good. I'm a trained interior decorator. Okay, so compl so David and I disagree on this point. I think we've hit re peak complexity oh. already. Maybe not from a marketer perspective because it's still so cloudy. But if we think about the crappy media supply chain is now under pressure. We're seeing consolidation. We're seeing cowboy like businesses going out of business. Hmm. We're seeing dominant players come out like I don't know the trade desk or others with a, a more of a transparent agenda. Yep. I think we're seeing marketers uh, refuting complexity. Mark Pritchard, one of many, who said complexity, your complexity is not my problem. We need demanding simplicity, and I, I think I think we've hit the peak of that. That would be my my thought. I don't think you're wrong. The only thing is the the grass continues to grow. So I, on Wednesday I did the the upfronts for J C Deco with their. Um, they're equivalent of an ad exchange for outdoor because they're now f more than 50% uh, digital. And I think it's a very good system, very simple, but it does add to the, you know, we've got all the other media forms and channels will begin to form exchanges and different currencies. So I do think there is room for it to get worse, yeah. even worse. And the human condition is usually to assume we're at peak of anything when in reality we're at the foothills of the mountain yeah. to come. So we'll see, it's a I think it's one of those we're gonna to have to find out. But I agree, there's enough pressure now that maybe we're, we're reaching the top, maybe. Good, okay, well we, we're gonna list these as either being kind of now, next, or future, yeah. future things. Uh, so we'll, put that as a, we'll put that as a now stroke next, uh, imminently, hopefully we'll keep peak complexity. Okay. The second thing was trust. Trust remains the biggest issue for marketers, you said. Yeah, and specifically trust of your trust of a few things here: your agency within media, uh, trust within the organisation that the marketing department know what they're doing, uh, trust um, certainly with the with the digital channels, mm -hmm. and later on trust with other channels that traditionally have been trusted that are now being questioned as well. So I think I think there is a genuine, complete. I mean, you look at the number of pitches going on everywhere. That is a direct result of. Uh, you know, they, they'll, it's not written in the document that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going out to tender because I don't trust my current agency, but that's probably the biggest single driving factor. It's not just price anymore, it's that I want to find someone that probably offers me better transparency. Yeah, and a, and a you know, a more deep-rooted, long-term, trusting, productive, strategic partner relationship, whatever you want to call it, yeah, with their agencies. The, that's yeah. what we see a lot more now being part of pitch briefs. Yeah, and a new contract that, that you know, it's yeah. not really trust because you know if I, I I trust my wife, I don't have to get a sign of things saying I'm not going to have sex with men while you're away. I think what we're seeing, you know, with these new yeah. contracts is, is I don't think trust is necessarily implicit. It's I've got you. It has to be written down. Yeah, because I don't yeah. trust you. you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's and that's one where and trust takes time to rebuild. I mean, it's been pretty broken. We've done some research here, which we've talked about quite a lot previously. Uh, you know, looking at uh, the trust that marketers have in particularly in their media agencies and it's pretty low I mean again maybe we've, maybe we've hit you know low trust yeah. and we're on the on the on the rebound well but, but that's an issue because I take time yeah I, I, and I think that one even if everything was fixed tomorrow I think that will hang around unfortunately media agencies and media people for a very long time mm. so I think there's a real echo that means that even if things are fixed which they won't be by 2018 the the media agencies are dodgy now has become fairly or unfairly a dominant trope mm. within the yeah. industry. And, right? some, and quite toxic, into, I think, to some agencies are not going to maybe recover from that. Yeah, no. From, I, from, from that label. I th and that's a relatively new thing. I, I think it were, there were a few dark rumours five years ago, and now, generally in marketing, there's a belief, again, fairly or unfairly, major agencies are dodgy operations. Sad. So let's throw that one further down the road, then, because that's going to be something which long-term is going to be resolved. I think that's not necessarily something we're going to see it in 2018. It can't be resolved, no, because the image it will is now been established. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So point number three, transparency. Uh, digital media might have lit the spark for transparency, but it would be unfair to single out programmatic. And then you talked about other different types of types of media. So what what, what about transparency there? Well, I think the key point there, and this is directly from Cass, but I agree with him. And as someone that's very critical of digital media, a lot. I think we do have to be fair to them. I think they have um, revealed the, a lot of the transparency issues and they have, it has been endemic within digital media. 
But I think the point that Cass makes in the interview, and which I, I certainly think is, is fair, is that it's, it, he describes it as the top of the mountain. Mm. The point being, the stuff that's been going on top in... Top of the iceberg. Yeah, top, top of the iceberg, iceberg sorry. Is, is the, um, the TV industry is next, in his opinion. You know what I mean? That there have been things going on in the rest of the, the media industry which are now going to also be revealed as the kimono is sort of pulled away. And I think that's fair. I don't think we should, we should give the digital industry some credit here. They are a new industry. They're not you know, trying to rip everyone off. They don't really know themselves what they're doing a lot of the time. And it's opening now a much bigger Pandora's box. Yeah. And, and it's only fair to say that. This is not a digital media problem exclusively. It's a media problem. Yeah. And so to us, that is something that is going to, that is, is live right now, that is changing right now. I agree. Transparency is part of the language that marketers are using. It's a function of every single brief yeah. in our experience, uh, every single pitch brief, every single evaluation of media agency as a partner, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of everywhere and it's now seeped into the narrative. So that, we agree, that is, well, and that I'd is like, a live thing. Right yeah, now. and I'd like, I think we should call out a and in America, ISBA over here. Mm. I mean, ISBA got a lot of crap about the, that contract and, and it was bad stuff that they were giving, you know, people were saying, well, there were different industries and they're different, and, and the whole point of that ISBA contract was, it, you know, it was a template. But you could feel there was still this resistance. So yeah, I think that's a success actually, that transparency has now passed from the institutions into the actual business contracts. Yeah. Uh, just on those contracts, by the way, I mean, both, I mean, the ISBAR created that contract uh, and we were involved in drafting that oh, and, and that. giving the notes and the, the accompanying notes that, were, that went with it. So we collaborated with, with ISBAR to create that. The a a then took that contract and amended it for the US market. So the a yeah. have their own uh, template, which you know, those marketers in the US, uh, some of our clients have been implementing. And in our experience, what's been really interesting is, is this, there was, and there has continued to be, resistance from the agencies, obviously, to accept that contract outright, rightly so, which tells you that it's a good contract, yeah. because it's written in the, in the interest of the marketer. Um, I didn't say marketer there. Marketer. I'm getting it from you. Uh, in the interest of the marketer, um, all of the agency groups have, have a prepared position. So in our yeah. experience, you know, like you put in like, well, we can use the ANA contract or we're gonna use the ISBAR contract and they can immediately send you a red line version of it that says, as a group, we don't agree with these following things. And then it's just a case of negotiating, obviously, and leveraging, but everybody's using it, which is good to see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's worked, that bit's worked. But it, again, it doesn't mean that trans... Well, it, to your point, transparency is now, I guess is what you're yeah, going to say, Yeah, they're right? pushing yeah, for yeah, it. Okay. I mean, market in the sense that marketers understand it and they realise that actually transparency, which is this phrase that's banded around, is represented by these contracts. But the only thing I would say is the transparency discussion contracts are now, but the actual transparency is later on. No, it's coming, yeah. It's coming, it's not here. We're, get, we're asking for it. It's like a burger, you know? I've ordered a burger, but it hasn't arrived yet. Yeah. Because we're not transparent yet. We're going to get there. We'll get there in 2018. Well, yeah, by that, definition. That would be my, my agreement. Let's move on to the next one. The big five holding companies are in terrible trouble. <laughs> well, they are. I mean, they have to be. And this is where Cass's honesty or agenda, or however you read it, and, and what we've heard elsewhere is true. And, and so I was always skeptical of the story of these procurement agents that were forcing down the commission rates. Mm. I, I work a lot with, not in the same area, but I get procurement agents all the time when I do a bit of work for a client and stuff. Yeah, but they're not, you know, you, an idiot like me can, you know, for relatively large amounts of money can still make a pretty strong case for please, you know, piss off basically. Um, so there was certainly a downward force, but what Cass says and what others have said off the record before is that what's been happening over the last 10 years at least is the revenue source or the profit source for the big media agencies was less from commission and more and more coming from reselling so the commission value banks. And the relationship between the two is important because effectively all of the media agencies or many of them were after as big a media account as they could get so they could get a hands on $100 million of media, which by definition would give them five or 10 or $15 million of rebated media. And so they competed with each other to bring the commission rates down in order to get that big pile of cash. And that was their source of money. Now, the, the figure we don't know, and there are estimates, is the proportion of profit, and I guess the media agencies that are doing this don't even know it exactly, 
the percentage of your actual profit that comes from reselling media versus commission. But most, almost everyone agrees that there's much more coming now from uh, reselling media. Now the problem of all of this now is transparency removes all of this, not completely, but pretty much. So these new contracts just mean that that reselling value bank stuff will certainly decrease and diminish to a certain level. You can't raise commission rates because you yourself have been dealing with 0.5, 0.7, 1.2. And that means that these big five are in big trouble. I think the big issue with the value banks, they're not illegal, uh, is are they swaying the, the, the agencies to select certain media over another? I have a guy called Handy Andy who laid my floor in my new house. Mm. And I'm pretty sure he got, a, you know, he, I wanted to have oak, uh, tazzy oak on my kitchen floor. And he wanted me to have birch wood. And I'm pretty sure he got about a $500 voucher for himself for buying so much birch wood from this other provider. I don't mind that. What I'm concerned with is he switched me to birch so he could get a $500 and actually my oak would have been a better flooring. That's the bit that concerns clients is not that it's happening, but it's swaying the choices. And if you remember back to what uh, John Mandel had said in that famous Miami thing, that was the big moment. He said, you know, that it's one thing to blow the client's money, but we, we don't even care about their strategies. You know, we're, we're picking it based upon what we think is gonna give yeah. us the most money. And that's also what Debbie Morrison has said it is, but she doesn't believe that the age, media agencies have the interests of the clients at heart. It's all coming from the same place, which is I am now looking for the platforms or the buys that will give me the most profit and not necessarily give the client the best return. Mm. And, and our challenge to that, because I don't, I, I don't totally agree with that, mm. uh, is that the marketers are complicit in that outcome. And the, re the reason is, is because you know, if you are a marketer and you go to a media agency and you say, I'm only gonna pay you 1% commission, and you can feel very pleased with yourself that you've negotiated the income of the agency mm. down or your, your own costs down. Often what the marketers have done or sometimes procurement, their procurement colleagues have done is give away in exchange, give away rights to uh, transparency, give away rights to audit. Yeah. And actually you give up your right to interrogate the agency's planning at that point because if you drive them to a 1% deal, the agency's typically a break even on a traditional media mix might be about 2.5%. Yep. So if you're paying less than 1% commission, uh, you have to be acknowledging that the agencies can need to make that up somewhere else. Yep. But otherwise they're just simply losing money and they're not charities. That's true. And they have opportunities to make money through certain decisions or certain agreements that they might make because rebates themselves are not crooked, they're not illegal. So some advertisers might be saying, you keep the rebates, fill your boots. It looks like a win-win. I'm paying you practically nothing for, for your services and you get paid whatever you can figure out. And the, all, all that's fine. Right? And, but that's the thing that cr has created corrupt planning principles because in your handy handy example, you're asking the agency, you're allowing the agency to recommend stuff to you that makes them the most money. And you don't really have a right to challenge it. Yeah, but th there is that, this is back to the trust moment, right? So when I get handy handy to lay my floor, I, I am assuming that he really has my best interests at heart. And that isn't contracted because it just is implicit. And I think that's the point where, I agree with you, if, if, we, if we agree to that low commission level, we're, we're letting you go out and hunt and take that money back, but not agreeing to allow you to make that the main leading factor in the media you choose. And that's where, again, it drives into some of the digital ad exchanges that have been suboptimal because they're so much more profitable. Yeah. Good, okay, so uh, we're only halfway through of your eight list. There's a mm. lot, to, lot to do. So, uh, so the big five, we're saying you're in terrible trouble just because their business model is largely under threat if they're operating in the ways that we've just described. And it's not gonna be possible for them to go back to a 2001 model yeah. where commissions come back. Because as you know, once you peg prices, it's, and there's four other players under pegging it, Commissions can't go back up yeah. again. So the only way that this can be resolved, in my opinion, is you will see significant cost cutting, which means, as I said in the column, three different types of M&A activity. Most likely and immediately, I would expect, you will see the agency groups consolidating the agency's brands within their groups together. I agree with that. 
The, too, many, too many egos at play. Too many, well, they're going to be smashed together, but we'll see. Yeah. The next one would be you're going to see the big five potentially merge together, and there's been a few rumours of that, but a couple of the big players might end up forming big five becomes big four. And the third option is one of them gets acquired or two of them get acquired by external forces, which is most likely to be the big audit firms mm. who are obviously now very interested in this business. So th I think this period of stability where all you ever see with the big five is them acquiring something is about to change and we're going yeah. to start to see some big M&A activity. That, we completely agree with that and that's imminent, I think. That's quite, let's, let's just say that's something that's happening right now. Uh, we know that the big five are, have had kind of some wobbles in their H1 reporting and big question, investors and analysts having big questions as to like what the future of these companies are. So that's real and present. And we should add, I don't think either of us buys the fact that the wobbles we're seeing in H1 are down to Facebook taking all the money or Procter & Gamble spending less money. They're small, not explanatory issues. The real reason the H1 wobbles are happening is the impact of this uh, you know, reduction in, in, in value banks is now taking hold. It doesn't take long for these things to impact the bottom line, and, and we think that I think that's what's going on, at least yeah. from what I've heard. Yeah, that's right. And the, and the way that we describe that often is that media agencies, particularly when they're earning commission, they are a bit like banks in that they earn money on money. Yeah. So they can only make their commission when you give them your billings. They yeah. can only make money based on your on your media budget. So they mm. make money on money. Much like a, your high street bank, you know, you don't go in and you ask, you don't ask them what they do with your large deposits, Mark. Uh, you just know that they give you free banking. Right. That's the trade-off. And lots of people have been viewing media agencies in that same way, perhaps. Mm. Uh, they make money off your money. So, you know, as maybe loopholes uh, uh, disappear, as increasing scrutiny over transparency and the opportunity to make money on money, those things are decreasing. So they, they have less opportunity to make money on money yep. and potentially uh, less money upon which to make money because budgets are pretty flat and if, in, if anything, maybe fragmenting away from the big five That's in many cases. Happening. Yeah. Well, look, the digital duopoly are playing direct where they, where they can and that will only increase over time. That's bound to happen. So yeah, tough times for sure and M&A of some kind likely. Good. Okay, let's move on. Uh, number five. The biggest transformation in media buying is going to be the automation. Yeah. Yeah. Not just the shift to digital, but general automation. And, I, and, what, and I, yes, so I don't think that's particularly surprising, but there's a couple of implications. So I think automation, I think automation which takes place increasingly in house or in a hybrid model. So big clients, big banks, big supermarkets that are spending whatever your definition of big is, 10 million plus whatever a year, probably a lot bigger than that, will realize significant strategic and economic scale advantages by bringing more of it in-house and taking many of these good media agency people client side. Also, I think this idea of ad exchanges being almost exclusively associated with digital media will quickly end and somehow, and I have no idea how, all the traditional media will, will, will turn themselves into exchanges. Now, I was part of the JC Decau upfront on Tuesday where they demonstrated their new uh, exchange tool. It's not quite as expansive as digital because we, you know, it's not per person, it's, you're buying a fixed site, mm -hmm. but it's an ad exchange. And it's, a, you know, it's based on the fact that more than 50% of their uh, outdoor sites are now digital. How TV and radio and even cinema mm -hmm. And print do that, I don't know, but they're going to have to do it. And I, be, and I believe that's where the moment of the digital, traditional rubbish dichotomy finally disappears. And, and also where we get our cross-platform cross metrics, because suddenly they're going to have to all be on, and let's be honest here, a couple of exchanges, maybe one per channel. Mm. That's the revolution that programmatic initially promised us, that's when we get all of the things we wanted. Yeah, and, and actually that links to your, your sixth point, which was uh, you know, having this common exchange, which is a little, somewhat yeah. utopian vision, but it's exactly, we, so don't agree that necessarily advertisers are going to quickly in-house things mm. because there's still huge complexity and some of those, where some have done it, there's mixed results. But you would have to think that, to be fair, you have to declare your, you know, as Feynman said, the person you fool, most likely to fool is yourself, right? In your yeah. position in a media agency, super cool and everything, you have to tell yourself, it's like me as a professor, I don't believe you, know, you can replace me with a digital class. 
because if you if if that's possible, then I'm basically fundamentally redundant in every sense of the word. So you, you know your you, your bias would be here, right? You know what I mean? It, yeah, maybe that what, we have maybe have some some role to play in the future. Well, you'd hope so. I, I expect to be on a beach by then, Mark. I, I hope you know that. Um, but automation, absolutely. Yeah. Automation of all media buying uh, and all operated through more standardized ways of trading across all types of media. And program, you know, all media to be potentially be able to be optimized and bought programmatically, yes. Yeah. Uh, will it all be in-house? I don't know. I still think that there'll be a, yeah, yeah, a, a, a kind of need for expert, of time, expertise. Yeah. That'll take a lot of time. But uh, what I really love is this idea of you know, com much more common exchanges. We've, David and I have talked uh, previously, well, maybe we'll link to that episode. We talk about this thing called the democratization of media buying, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is where uh, if you truly m meet or match the buyers of media with the sellers of media on a standardized exchange, then it becomes a little bit like eBay. Everything is biddable based on the requirement. And the beautiful thing about that is that it does not respect scale. So yeah, yeah, exactly. you may be a billionaire and I may just have $50 in my pocket. Doesn't matter. We can both bid for the same bicycle. If I want it more than you, it has more intrinsic value to me than it does to you, I will, I will win out and, every and, single time. And that time. goes for who's selling me you as well, that yes. a small piddly little tool like radio can suddenly demonstrate its value versus Facebook in a manner which is, you know, comparable. Yeah. Now, I would have, the, the one big caveat here is, I don't know how many exchanges there are, like there's 300 or something, details, not my strong point here. But the point is, the, the thing that's killing us right now is too many exchanges, and we're only gonna get more, and that increases arbitrage and fraud and, and holes. So I think this is all great as long as, I think the very maximum number to, for this vision to come true is we'd have to have, you know, let's call it, uh, you know, radio exchanges for radio ads and it links somehow into TV exchange. Mm. And ideally, there'd only be one exchange, which is kind of like the financial stock markets and it's, yeah. it's you know, properly audited. But right now, we're just going to get more exchanges, which is, means that more ad fraud is going to take place. And th but that's, that's the industry building complexity, which is not in the interest of the marketers. It's not market oriented. That's right. right. That's right. Uh, what marketers want, and we encourage all the time, and I hope you do too, encourage marketers to demand simplicity and simplification of this, and actually to go out and say, I'd love for a marketer to stand on stage and say, we dream of one open exchange for all buying yeah. and selling of media. If more of you said that, maybe somebody would figure out an entrepreneurial way of making it happen. So at the moment, the margin is in, is in competition. So everyone's got their own exchange with their own rules and it's their own way of doing things and can monetize that in a competitive way. Nobody's, nobody's being incentivized to break down or merge or share. There's no open source. Well, and let's add to that, the publishers and platforms have an incentive not to open the doors mm. either. The real reason we don't have more comparable metrics is because if that was to happen right now, There'd only be a couple of winners. Obviously, it would depend on different times and demographics. But you know, I don't know who offers truly the best value for a certain demo at a certain time in a certain category between YouTube and Facebook video. But I do know one of them would be spectacularly more valuable than the other mm. if you could lay that out. And both of them are scared it's not them. Yeah. I think we're, what we are agreed on there is that it's going to take a while. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's one, definitely for the future. But I think something that we strongly feel we should all aspire to. And that was what pro, that's what we meant by programmatic when we started talking about this naively seven years ago. You know, that, I mean, that's yeah. the real dream of it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Number seven was the rise of consultants and audit firms. So yeah. you're saying, what an opportunity for them. So because in fact, actually, all of the other seven things pretty much are should be incredibly encouraging, right, for consultants and audit firms saying oh, that's opportunity it. all the way down the line. We, we, we've known that PwC and EY and Deloitte and Accenture are, are suddenly hiring guys left, right and centre from media agencies and creative agencies. There's been not really a lot of clarity on what they're up to. There's certainly, from my contacts, it's all been focused around programmatic. Mm. And so what, what we now get is the answer to that, right, that one or two of the audit firms Look at what an audit firm like EY or Delight is specializes in, how they make their money elsewhere. It's in you know, logistics, it's in reducing supply chain, it's big organizational change, it's IT systems, it's fraud prevention, it's large scale transfers of money, it's you know, business operation optimization. It's 
the, the big audit firms are in this because they want to either, you know, if Tom's right, help them improve the way they manage programmatic, or if I'm right, they're the agents that bring the thing in-house and help a big company create and monitor their ad exchanges. Mm. And in, in a nutshell, it's, you know, we're, they're going to teach the companies how to fish um, with a very expensive fishing boat rather than keeping buying from a fishmonger in the yeah. shape of a media agency. Yeah. And we're, we're starting to observe some really interesting tension because a, a lot of these kind of companies that you mentioned are already advisors at a very senior level into some of the you know, largest advertisers in the world. So yeah. they are already a trusted and installed straight into the C-suite. kind of strategic partner straight into the C-suite. And they are then from the top down starting, we're seeing you know, being much more involved in marketing decision making. Uh, in some cases, we're being partnered with some of these management consultants who are coming from above, and we're being partnered with them as, as media specialists well, uh, to help they, them They're going to buy you, aren't they? Well, I don't know. I don't know if we're lucky enough. No, no uh, they, they are. I are mean, they? If, you're, yeah. if you're any good, and I think you are, I think they will come around sniffing at your door if they're not already sniffing. Well, we're, def we're definitely we're partnering on the client's behest at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's, what we're seeing is that, that then as we execute those strategies, uh, for the client mm. is that different parts of that organization sometimes are then popping up in tenders <laughs> to, for, for, to be the executional part of something which they've driven from the top down. Oh, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Well, it's not. Kind of, it is for you because you, you don't work in this space as much as I do. That's how that's their business model. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, that's, I mean, but that tells you how, what integrity and what trust these businesses have is because they're the handy andy, right? They're, they're there at the top decision and you trust them with the execution and the delivery as well because there's never a moment where you question that that's a problem. Well, and that's called brand equity. Yeah. Um, and no one ever got fired for hiring McKinsey. Um, because, or ID comes, by the way. Or ID comes, by the way. But it's an old saying, you know, if you're not sure what the heck you're doing, get McKinsey in and go, well, I got McKinsey in and we still didn't get it right, you know? Yeah. So that, that element of trust, yeah. And there's no doubt the audit firms are definitely shaking the trees in the background because it's all coming their way. And you know, right now they're hiring a big bunch of famous names in marketing, partly because they want partners in marketing, partly they just want to create the illusion that they have this skill, um, and then it'll be business as usual. But yeah, I, I think they're gonna be a big player. I think they either acquire or build, or both. And I think they're gonna, I mean, and they don't, you, know, you have to understand these firms and how they operate. They're long-term grinders. They're everything that media agencies aren't and they will just gradually grind their way into this business. Yeah. And they won't, you know, it's not like they're gonna stop, they're gonna just move in like very slow bulldozers and, you know, take most of the value. It's okay. It's lovely, isn't it? On that happy note, Merry Christmas. Yeah. Uh, that's, ha that's, happening. that's happening right now. Um, so that's not something to watch out for the future, just keep an eye on it. And we expect kind of movement quite imminent uh, in this space. Uh, lastly, and this is a, this is a big one, Ultimately, you say, mm. media planning and buying will become more effective. <laughs> uh, Imagine that. Which is good. And in, in our language, that, you know, we agree, I guess, to, into that. Uh, what we love to see and what we're really hopeful of is that marketers and uh, advertisers generally see media value and not it as a commodity, right? See it as a marketing discipline that has an ROI, that is an investment in growth. Yeah, where well, there's creativity and, and, and there's skill, yeah. Effective. But also that it's just not seen as a risk. You know, at the moment, yeah. if you offer most CMOs a deal and say, right, I can guarantee your media will be, your media strategy will be pretty average, but there'll be no fraud and there'll be no scandal and you won't get into trouble over any of it for the next 10 years. They don't take the deal. Yeah. So to your point, yeah, let's, commodity is a thing to aspire to right now. First of all, not a risk profile, then not a commodity then a genuine strategic advantage. Yeah. I think that's, that, but we are both confident, I think, not yet, that, that we will get to a place where the complexity of the media out there is matched, more than matched, by the mm. skill of whoever's doing the media strategy yeah. inside. Right now, it's clear that complexity has overwhelmed skill and systems yeah. completely, but our systems will eventually evolve to manage it. But not at the moment, yeah, not at the moment. And that, that was essentially, if you, go, if you wind back like 10 months and remind ourselves of what Mark Pritchard laid out as yeah. his five-point action plan for media transparency, that's essentially what he was saying was, he, he never said, 
give me great creative no. media plans, give me innovation and you know, inspiring ideas. He said, like, just give me the basics. Get it out of my face. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we should give a shout out to Pritchard. I mean, like Keith Weed's a very influential guy and, and has done great work too. But this is Pritchard's show and he's gone down as, I mean, I wrote a thing about him when he gave his talk in January and I said it's the biggest speech in 25 years, which was a bit hyperbolic at the time, but it's turned out handily to be totally true. Yeah, exactly. My one quick question on Mark Pritchard, because that kind of that, that rounds off our kind of eight points. That only took about an hour. Yeah, yeah that was good. Um, so, Mark, absolutely, we completely agree. I mean, it, that was the most significant statement out loud on media that there'd been. That's uh, ever been, I think, personally. And it, and it was a brilliant moment and a threshold. Again, permission only, I think, because the ANA had already prepped the ground for him to be able to do that, I think. But remember the way he did it as well, and what he, you know, he made 2017 the year where, it wasn't a grandstanding speech, it actually had a goal and an object. It was a very, very PNG pragmatic. thing. You yeah. must do this, this and this, by this date, or you won't get this. So it wasn't, look at me, I've got a vision. It was a genuine communication. Yeah. I think it's a spectacularly important moment. And, it, and, it, and maybe a personal kind of reputational gamble because he was really confronting oh, the industry. No, no, very they could have ignored him. Issues. They could have ignored him, for so sure. It could have been quite damaging or Humili humiliating, humiliating, potentially. Absolutely. But now that we know, I mean, I think by the time he got to, you know, can, let's say halfway through the year, this already had great momentum. He's just been named Mark of the Year. Well, duh. Right, right yeah. Uh, he will, sneak peek, be named the IDCOM's Media Person of the Year. Well, we duh. don't normally announce till December. I thought it was me, but I'm, I'm okay. But there we go, maybe January. next year. Um, why are more not joining the bandwagon? That is the thing that's absolutely puzzling us. Why are marketers around the world, CMOs, not queuing up to be part of Mark's kind of like momentum here? Uh, there's three, probably three factors. The, 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 the cliche about CMOs only having an average tenure of two or three years is true. So they're just not in it long enough to really either care or get it. Mm. Um, second, most of them don't know what's going on. Back to our early discussion, like they really aren't on top of this. You've really got to be good. I mean, Pritchard himself, I think, admitted that it took him a long time to get his head around what was going on. Yeah. Many people aren't that good. And then third, a lot of them, frankly, are complicit within this. You know, Pritchard's honesty, where he admitted, you know, he, he discovered one of his major agencies had a value bank, which it was reselling, yep. and he'd authorised that unknowingly. Blah, blah. To do that, you've really got to have the interests of the industry and your own business ahead of your own personal reputation. And, and there aren't many CMOs that feel that way. I think Pritchard is, goes down as a genuine hero here. And it's nice, because P&G are the kind of marquee, original marketing player right yeah. from the 1930s. And just at a time when everyone's questioning them and Laffley's left and all that, here comes Pritchard and really without him, you know, one man, we would be in a demonstrably worse place right now. I think you, you, a lot of these changes can be tied back to him. So I think it's a rare example of what we, what we like to call leadership, which is often like, you know, inspiration and leading through others and all that other horseshit. This is what leadership is, which is making a decision and then getting everyone else to follow you. And I think that's... It's a really great moment. The two great moments for me of, of advertising in the last 25 years are, well, put the Apple ad in, the Apple Super Bowl ad, right, is the first one. Then it's Zuckerberg exactly 10 years ago next month announcing advertising was dead and it would be replaced. You know, it was 23 years old, mm. right? It was all bullshit. He did a brilliant job of destabilizing everyone and then promptly launching advertising. And then Pritchard, this, this speech in January of this year, is a marquee moment that we'll not, we'll not see again, I think, in our, in our time in marketing. Good. And that's triggered, arguably, a lot of the things that we've been talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. been really one of the catalysts to this. Uh, I think we should end there on a, on a nice positive note. Given yeah. that we're making lots of predictions, why don't we, let's make a date and we'll do this again at some point and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll flick back next year at some point and uh, see where we've got to. Uh, and a question for you to finish, maybe. Well, was I better than Gary Vee? Uh, well, you'll, uh, viewers will judge. Why don't we? That's, our, <laughs> that's our question of the week. Uh, we'll link to uh, an interview I did with Gary Vaynerchuk. That was 18 months ago. And strangely, coincidentally, Gary was due to be here yesterday, but couldn't make it. But he's going to be coming back in a month or so. And we'll so do it against Gary's I new will, video. Yeah, we'll, 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 ask, we'll ask Gary. Uh, the difference between Gary and you, though, is that Gary wants to be in and out of here in 15 minutes and you very kindly <laughs> come and had a cup of tea and you've been hanging out for a couple of hours. I brought my dad. Brought your dad to make yourself Gary V doesn't bring his dad with him to he me. Does not, I'll no, tell you that right now. Not.
And he flies off in a car in the back of a limo. I now hobble away with my old man up the street to my next meeting. You know what I mean? Like, where are we going? You know I mean? Yeah. Good. So we'll do a little poll. Uh, watch the two videos and, and then you decide. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. My pleasure, mate. Have a good rest of the year. Um, congratulations on, on, uh, on everything going so well. And good luck with the new office. Cheers. Yeah, this is the last thing that we are going to do in this office. Uh, Mark is leaving now and we are going to start packing the books. And as of next week, we will be in the new place. So thank you very much for watching this Media Snack Meets. Uh, we'll see you next time. And David's back next week. It won't be me. Yeah. You're glad to know. Better looking and equally northern. <laughs>